My name is Alex, I'm a postdoc at uh, CETA in Toronto, and thanks very much uh, for having me here. So this is going to be an overview of the Science Observatory, um, the basic plan for the Science Observatory going forward in the next few years, and then an overview of the science goals, most of which we've heard the mass, vast majority about already at this, at this workshop, so this will be, uh, to some extent, a uh, review. Okay. So this is a picture of the site which is used for CMB studies at the Atacama Plateau, uh, up here uh, 5,200 degrees above sea level. Uh, back here is, this is the ground, this is not the ACT telescope, but the ground screen surrounding the ACT telescope. And in the front are these three, uh, these three dishes from the Simons Array, which is the successor to the polar bear. Um, so what are the benefits to doing CMB observations from Chile? So, uh, this is the observable sky, which is the light part of this plot, um, when you're at the latitude of Chile. Um, you can see, from there you can see these, these low foreground regions that we've been talking about for doing B-mode studies. Um, but also you have a lot of overlap with optical surveys, a lot of which are concentrated around the equator and even north of the equator. And you're able to see those uh, uh, from Chile, uh, including ALMA, which is something that you can imagine doing follow-up on. Uh, on CMB selected sources. Um, this is the, the plot of the Moore's Law for CMB surveys. So each successive generation of CMB surveys is cranking up the number of detectors in order to reduce uh, the noise and the maps that are coming out. Uh, so each, in this rough plot, each successive generation is, is going up in number of detectors by an order of magnitude. Um, a bunch of people in the room are currently involved in analyzing data from this third generation which we've heard a fair bit about, and then the Simons Observatory fits in somewhere here. Okay. Um, so this is uh, the basic overview of Simons Observatory, is the existing telescopes are uh, the ACT here, and then in green, the Simons Array, which you can think of as the successor to Polar Bear, and then our also existing is CLASS, which is, which is going after different science. Um, the plan of the Simons Observatory is to build new telescopes, so this would be, for instance, where a new large aperture telescope would go, and then multiple small aperture telescopes, which will be focused on looking for large-scale B modes. So imagine two, two of these blue circles here. And then uh, in white, there's, there's space to add future uh, small-scale or, or even large-scale telescopes uh, down the road. So this is a merger of the ACT and Polar Bear slash Simons Array teams uh, coming together and working together. Uh, as such, there are many members, so 150 members uh, from institutions all around the world. Um, and here is a photo of a recent collaboration meeting. And I played Where's Waldo with this photo. And I found that, so there are 14 Simons Observatory members uh, at this conference this week. And each, each of them have, have their own uh, regime of expertise. So don't just ask me about Simons Observatory. You have 13 other people that you can chat with about this. Okay, so the rough timeline for this is right now we are deeply involved in uh, the planning, so the optimization of the instrument and the survey and the development of the technology. So that's what we're, we're doing right now. Uh, meanwhile, there are logistical upgrades going on at the site. Um, the plan is around the end of 2020 to have constructed uh, telescopes and also uh, some new uh, receivers, which will be CMB S4 type. Uh, so this is together with the technology development for CMBS4. Um, but instead of filling out the focal planes completely, uh, some subset of the focal planes will be filled in on this time scale uh, for doing Simon's observatory science. And then the plan is to start observing 2021 and then with the first science results coming out uh, a year or two after that. Um, so how does it fit in with CMBS4, which is this broad community -based, broader community-based effort? Uh, so it, it's a stepping stone to CMBS4. In particular, the technology, theory, and analysis development, uh, all these different things uh, are, are, we're thinking about making the, dealing with much larger data sets and so on. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, S4 capable telescopes and receiver prototypes being built in Chile as part of this program. Um, and just a quick sketch of, uh, so the, the planning for the, the telescopes is, uh, there's, they're being designed right now, so there are a number of, of designs that are being picked around. Um, so there will be small and large aperture telescopes. Uh, for the small aperture telescopes, here are just two pictures of what they might look like. So this two refractor setup, 
And then uh, this tr cross Dragone setup where the light bounces back upon itself. Uh, so the small aperture telescopes, there will be several of them, each of which will be sensitive to a couple of different frequencies. And the plan is to probe many frequencies, of course, to deal with the foregrounds that we've been talking about all week. Uh, there will also be half-wave plates for the reasons that Lyman explained in his talk. Okay. Uh, the large aperture uh, telescope, uh, the, the team is very interested in the science opportunities that are available if you map small angular scales. That means having a five or more meter aperture, so similar to the existing ACT or SPT, SPT which is 10 meters, um, to get you to a, an arc minute scale resolution at 150 gigahertz. And so this is a much larger cross dragonic uh, design, and uh, if, if you zoom in here, the, the focal plane, you can imagine having space for many S4 type receivers, which will be partially filled. And we're currently working on optimizing the trade-offs between sensitivity and frequency coverage here. So this is one of many possible considerations where you have a low frequency, medium frequency, and then high frequency optics tubes, uh, which are covering the ranges of, of frequencies that you see here. Okay. So uh, I want to quickly overview uh, the science goals, the kind of things that we can do with this, and, and some of, some of the uh, brief mention of some of the concerns that one might have. Um, I won't spend much on this, so R, obviously, uh, we're going after, um, after measuring the large-scale B modes with these uh, small aperture telescopes, and also um, we need to do D-lensing, so uh, using the large aperture telescope to get a lensing map to do uh, D-lensing. Uh, it makes sense to look at several patches of the sky in order to test for the isotropy of any B mode signal that you might find, so the plan is to look at several patches of the sky uh, going quite deep on, on each of those. Um, and then uh, other things that you can do with the large aperture dish, uh, so and effective. So um, we had a great talk from Daniel Bauman uh, the other day about how and effective has emerged as one of the uh, big targets for CMB studies going forward. And uh, this is exciting because uh, so and effective is just any amount of radiation density that you have in addition to photons. So it's not just neutrinos. Um, if you have some, some extra species uh, that act like radiation, it gives you extra damping in the CMB on small angular scales. It changes the damping scale. And then it, if additionally, if the species are free streaming like neutrinos are, you get this phase shift effect that Daniel explained. Um, so today, the Planck error bar on this is something like 0.2. Um, but for, every spe for a species that's in thermodynamic equilibrium uh, with standard model particles before last scattering, you expect the change of n-effective of at least 0.027, depending on, uh, depending on the details of, of the species. And you can see here, uh, this, is, this is tantalizingly close to, to that number. So this is the forecast for the error bar and n-effective that one can obtain um, in this forecast, where this is the temperature noise. So CMBS4 is looking at noise levels somewhere around here, one-ish micro Kelvin arc minute. S S O Simon's Observatory will be a bit noisier, so somewhere up, up in the middle of this plot. Um, details are still to be determined, uh, but you see that we are able to uh, get get very good constraints on on N effective, uh, getting getting closer to this this number. Um, so quickly, with some of the so some of the issues with this, so you want to go for a wide survey here. So this is a very different strategy than when you're trying to look for B modes. You want to map out as much of the sky as possible. Um, and, uh, and so the idea is to use that large aperture telescope uh, and split its time between a wide survey like this and then the small patches that will be targeted for the B modes. Um, this, this constraint, it turns out, is driven by the cross power spectrum between the T and E on the sky, which means that if you're computing the variance, anything that contributes to the variance in the temperature contributes here. So you might worry about things like the atmospheric power, which Lyman showed, also point sources in the temperature. Um, so those can have a small effect. And you might also worry about things like beam systematics, because if the, if the beam is slightly uncertain, it could look like changing the damping scale uh, and could have some crosstalk if your estimate of how that affected. Uh, another thing to quickly mention is that the D-lensing, D-lensing is not only for B-modes. So uh, you can also D-lens the temperature in E-modes, and what that does is it sharpens up the acoustic peaks. So Anthony showed a first result of that based on data. Uh, it turns out for N effective, you, if you do this de-lensing uh, and you localize the acoustic peak slightly better, you can get a better estimate of N effective, particularly in models 
where you allow other parameters that give not only phase shifts, but also other effects you can break, uh, you can significantly break degeneracies when you de-lens with the phi map that you have, the lensing map that you have. And it's something that just comes for free because we'll be making the lensing maps. Uh, anyway. um, okay, lensing auto spectrum, we've heard a fair bit about this. Uh, this is one of the, the key science targets for SL. Um, Mark says, so this is, the top row is the three-dimensional matter power spectrum, which has this peak at the quality, matter radiation quality scale. When you do the CMB lensing, you're taking a projection along the line of sight with the peak of the distribution coming at redshift two. So it's basically taking this matter distribution and very roughly speaking, thinking about what it looks like around redshift two. That means that when you change the neutrino density, the neutrino mass, sorry, uh, as Marlena explained to us the other day, uh, that reduces the matter power spectrum up here in 3D, but then also here in 2D. So when we're looking for massive neutrinos, we're really trying to measure the amplitude of this lensing power spectrum, and we have data, as, as Kyle just showed, uh, all throughout this spectrum. Uh, so these are the, this is, so this is a lie, this is not the current data, so I apologize, I don't have the points here from Kyle's uh, talk, which are very nice. Uh, but so as he said, uh, the Planck is leading the field with this uh, roughly 2% constraint, that's the purple squares. Um, and then the Simon's Observatory group is responsible for uh, the orange and, and the blue on here. Um, and uh, Blake had, had a, a nice talk talking about uh, what we should be able to do with Simon's Observatory. So he showed this thing where the error bars have been blown up by a factor of 10, and so we should be something like 1% on, on this power spectrum with Simon's Observatory. Um, going even farther to CMB S4, this is a plot from the S4 science book. These error bars are too small to see on here, but when you, when you blow them up, each red curve corresponds to a change in the neutrino mass of 30 milli electron volts. Um, and the, the cosmic variance error bars are in blue, and uh, S4 will be sample variance limited over the 40% of sky that it, in, in this forecast that it was assumed to observe will be sample variance limited out to scales around here, about L of a thousand, before the error bars start, uh, start blowing up. Um, and so the goal, with the, the goal going forward here, obviously, is to try to, uh, make a, to look for the impact of neutrino masses uh, using the CMB. Um, and these, these numbers are, are interesting because of the minimal mass of, of 60 milli electron volts that we, that we know. Okay. Uh, there's some challenges uh, to think about here. So very briefly, um, so, as, so Kyle was, was mentioning uh, using temperature lensing reconstruction and using polarization reconstruction. Uh, for Simon's observatory, depending on the, the final configuration, uh, it should be that these two have about the same weight. So with noise levels somewhere around here, this red curve is, is the noise uh, for uh, polarization and the blue curve is the noise for, for temperature. If you're somewhere in here, the, the two channels are roughly comparable in sensitivity. Um, and that's nice because they're statistically independent, so you can check for consistency. And they're also subject to different systematics. So for, for the temperature, we're, we're, we're concerned about extragalactic foregrounds, the, in particular the non-Gaussianity of uh, things like the sunny dovich effect, uh, dusty star-forming galaxies that show up in the maps. Whereas for polarization, uh, the concern has been more about galactic uh, foregrounds and, and non-Gaussianity in things like dust and synchrotron, especially on small angular scales where we don't have a lot of data. Um, and there was, a, there was a, a recent report on this for the core team that came out last week. Uh, but we're also looking at this uh, for a wide variety of, of dust models. Okay, so I spend most of my time working on the lensing, but something that I'm that I'd like to just highlight in the last bit of time is, is the Sunyov Deldovich science that will be enabled, which hasn't been talked about as much at this meeting. So, uh, so this is a map of the Compton Y parameter coming out of Planck, which is basically a line of sight integrated uh, measure of the, of the gas pressure. And what you see is you see all these massive galaxy clusters popping up. And so with a survey like this, you can go in and you can find and so you can find these uh, bright spots, essentially, and, uh, and so that's, that's going to be really exciting for us for. So there's the potential to discover tens of thousands of galaxy clusters, uh, which is an order of magnitude uh, more than Planck, particularly at higher redshift. So the Planck uh, clusters go out to redshift a half or one, um, 
we, uh, there's a big discovery space of, of new clusters or proto-clusters at, at high redshift that will be enabled with, with the future ground-based surveys like SO and, and S4 even, even more. Um, another thing that's really neat is, is uh, if you want to do cosmology with this cluster sample, you need to uh, be able to have a relationship between the Compton Y or the, or the pressure and the mass, which is the thing that the theory predicts. Um, the, a, a more standard way to do this is shown in the dash curve. So this is the signal to noise on measuring the masses if you have, uh, if you have optical lensing. So this is uh, a forecast for LSST with, uh, with these dashed lines. So, so for clusters that are sitting at a low redshift, LSST uh, will be great for determining the masses because there will be a fair number of LSST galaxies. What does that say? Zero. <laughs> uh, okay, we're almost there. So, uh, but, so that's, that's good up to redshift a half or so. Uh, but for higher redshift clusters, you start running out of galaxies from LSST. You want to have a source of photons that's behind. Um, and it turns out that the CMB lensing that we'll get for free in these surveys is, is competitive for getting the masses with LSST. Okay. I wanted to show also computing uh, the, the unresolved, uh, the, the power spectrum, um, which is probing a different set of, of masses of halos and particularly going to higher redshift. And then also something that I think is really neat because we have, particularly because we have a lot of non Gaussianity experts here. Um, so foregrounds are of non-Gaussianity are also interesting, not just primordial. Um, so there have been these detections of the, of the bispectrum of this Compton Y parameter um, and comparing those with theory and they're sensitive to a slightly different combination of cosmology and gas physics. Uh, I had one slide on KSE but it was basically just uh, an advertisement for the exciting stuff that Simone will talk about this afternoon uh, together with the nice overview that we have from Emmanuel. Uh, okay, so let me summarize. So the Simons Observatory will happen, it's funded, and uh, we're, we're meeting twice a year uh, to make it happen. And uh, the observing will start something like 2021. Uh, so we're doing many optimization studies to try to get the most science out of this as we can. Uh, we have a number of science targets that I've tried to sketch out, and these science targets can be obtained by looking in a number of different ways in these data, which will be very rich. Okay, thank you.